money, religion, politics, and sex. They are always mentioned as the taboo topics, ones you don't talk about at work or at the dinner table. They are awkward, personal, and differences of opinion can destroy relationships. And now, in 2020, all of those topics seem to be invading our social media feeds and news outlets, and probably the dinner table as well, in more and more graphic detail. We're not going to talk about any of those topics today, but we are going to talk about another topic that's dominating social media and the news, and probably your dinner table. One that can be just as awkward, personal, and even relationship destroying: race. And specifically, we're going to get even a little bit more awkward and talk about how to talk about race at work. Welcome to episode seventy-three of How Can I Say This, where we look to build connection and community through courageous conversations. I'm your host Beth Below, and it's been a while. I didn't intend to take a break, and I have to pull up a review that was left、um, in about a month ago,、um, titled "Love This Podcast." It's it's from Julian Alps or the Julian Alps. And they wrote, wondering why there is no update after six four twenty twenty. A lot of useful tips. Really enjoyed listening to this podcast. I really hope that that past tense of enjoyed、um, becomes enjoy again. And、um, my apologies. I <laughs> like so many other things in twenty twenty. This was not what I had planned. I think my taking some time off was connected to the last podcast that I started to post in late June, which, like this one, was also about race. Just about the time that I posted it, I had an extremely difficult conversation with a friend that really made me question my ability to have difficult conversations, especially about race. Because here I was thinking that speaking effectively and compassionately was one of my superpowers, and in this instance, I completely failed, and I ended up actually taking that episode down because it just it shook me so much. And then, as I kind of moved through that and learned from it,、um, and eventually felt gratitude for it, one week slipped into the next. As it has tended to do during this pandemic, and the next time I looked up, it was mid-August. So thank you for sticking with me. And the Julian Alps, I hope that、um, we are changing that to and you enjoy listening, because it's really good to be back. And I'm so glad that、um, all of you are here with me today. Today's guest is my go-to expert on all things negotiation, but he recently created a very popular course on LinkedIn about talking about race at work. And when I saw that pop up in my LinkedIn feed, I knew that he and I had to reconnect. Even though I know, admire, and trust him completely, I still felt self-conscious during this conversation. I was afraid that I was going to unintentionally say something stupid or offensive, and I think that's kind of the point of our conversation. It's uncomfortable to talk about race, so I tried to push through that discomfort. And you're probably going to hear that discomfort in my questions and in my responses to his sharing. I hope you take whatever you hear, and find some comfort and courage in it. I also did this interview on video via Zoom, and I'm posting it to my YouTube channel and my website once it's ready. It's a little experiment to mix things up a little bit. The、um, one of the next guests that I have, we're going to be talking about having difficult conversations over Zoom or you know a video conference, and so she and I thought it would be interesting to actually do it over Zoom. So when I was doing this interview, I said to Kwame, "Let's." Let's try Zoom. So we we gave it a try, and you'll find a link to the video along with how to connect with my guest at howcanisaythis dot com. So let's get right to it and meet my guest, who is a repeat guest on this podcast. Best-selling author and speaker Kwame Christian is the director of the American Negotiation Institute and a subject matter expert in the field of negotiation and conflict resolution. Kwame has conducted workshops throughout North America and abroad, and is a highly sought-after national keynote speaker. Host of the world's most popular negotiation podcast, Negotiate Anything, Kwame is dedicated to empowering others through the art and science of negotiation and persuasion. All right, well, shall we dive in? 
Surely. Let's do this. Um, so Kwame, welcome to How Can I Say This video version. <laughs> and and if, if, if anybody's listening to this and you're not seeing the video, that's because I somehow freaked out and decided not to do video, but we are doing on this on video um, in case that, uh, just to have the option, as I said. Um, so welcome, Kwame, glad you're here. Thank you, yes, it's great to be here. <laughs> So the other reason why this feels um, this feels a little uh, I, I approach this with some trepidation is because of our topic today. <laughs> um, we I want to talk to, with you about talking about race in the workplace, and I know that this is a topic that's um, high on your radar and near and dear to your heart because it's um, you've been posting more on LinkedIn about it. I believe you have a course on LinkedIn, correct? Um, that's been very popular. And, um, and of course, it's very top of mind in our culture. And I say I approach this with some trepidation, especially um, being on video, just because, and I should say, you know, I didn't come up with like a strict list of questions because it's one of those topics that sometimes I don't know what to ask. I don't, you know, and I think this is one thing that um, particularly white people, we don't know what questions are okay to ask if that makes sense. Um, it, it feels like we could be stepping into landmines. <laughs> um, so I appreciate that you are open to the conversation and, um, and open to, to any helping me avoid landmines. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. Although that's not your job. See, that's one of those landmines, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'll do my best and, and trust the conversation. So that's all my little disclaimer preamble. So thank you. <laughs> no, my pleasure. As a, as a lawyer, I appreciate a good disclaimer. <laughs> there you go. Is, that was a long rambling disclaimer, but that's what it was. So, so, let me, so let me ask first, what is, I mean, I don't want to assume anything. So let's just put out there this first question around like, um, what are, what are the conversations that are happening in the workplace around race? Like what is, what's going on right now and how is it different than maybe a year ago? Yeah. So the difference between now and a year ago is that it, the, the issue of race in, and diversity in the workplace and society in general, um, it is an unavoidable topic of discussion. Because before, you, we could kind of pretend like these weren't issues. There was a lot of um, willful ignorance, we could say, and mm -hmm. awkwardness, because nobody really wants to talk about it. I, I can't really think about somebody who wakes up in the morning and says, wow, I'm excited to talk about racial issues today. I don't think that, <laughs> that's a normal thing for people to do. And yeah. so when it's not top of mind, it's easy to say, let me just focus on my work. Let me just focus on my family, my personal issues, and then let's move on with the day. But with the recent happenings with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and all of those, uh, these things that have bubbled up, and given the fact that because of COVID, people are, have a lot more idle time, we can focus on these things a lot more. We don't have those distractions that, like we used to do. It's unavoidable. And so we, it, it's kind of a moment of reckoning for the country where we say, all right, now we all can see this. Now what? Now, what do we do about it? And I think that's where it starts within most companies. We're just trying to figure out what's next. What do we do? And that's where mm -hmm. the conversation starts. Yeah. I, I had a conversation with someone um, the other day, a friend, and I said something about, well, now that our world has been turned upside down. And his response was, well, my world, our world, as people of color, it's been upside down for a long time. So it's a little bit like, welcome to the party. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I imagine that that's part, it, it, it strikes me that that must be part of the conversation as well, that there's, um, that some of us are stepping onto a train that has been moving for a very long time. Um, how, how do we, um, how do you bring awareness to that while honoring where everyone is at? And to be more specific, are you saying awareness to the fact that the train has been moving. We're in all these different places. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a thing, but it just, it was kind of a, an awareness for me. Yeah. I, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because it depends on the relationship and the, the goal of the conversation. Um, because for some people, uh, for some people of color, it's a, it's a hurtful situation 
made more hurtful from the fact that why people weren't paying attention to it before. And so I've seen a lot of conversations start to go downhill because somebody says, listen, I want to be an ally. I realize now that there's an issue. What can I do to help? And then the person gets frustrated and says, how did you not know? We've been, we've been through this a long time. And so then the conversation breaks down very quickly because the person who wants to be an ally says, well, that did not feel good. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I didn't like that. And so let's break it down psychologically. So humans, we're always assessing situations, asking ourselves a simple question, just like any other animal, approach or avoid, approach or avoid. If I see a threat, I'm going to avoid it. If I see an opportunity, I'm going to approach it. So that's with that. That's why with me, with the American Negotiation Institute and the trainings that we do, we always say conflict is an opportunity. Let's start there. Conflict is an opportunity because if we think about it as a threat, it doesn't matter what I teach you. It doesn't make sense to give recipes to people who are afraid to get in the kitchen because you're not going to engage. So we have to change our mentality. And if you approach it um, in a way that's unduly hostile, uh, then you risk pushing people away and they see the conversation as a threat and where they were engaged at that moment trying to have the conversation. It was such a painful, unpleasant experience that they say, you know what, I'm going to avoid it next time. And so to, to answer the question, acknowledging that people are at different places, I think one of the, the best things we could do is recognize that, especially within the workplace, we're all on the same team. We're ostensibly trying to accomplish the same thing. And we look at other pe- the people around us as equal and team members. And I think we should start there and start by creating a a positive perspective on what we want our environment uh, to look like as it relates to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion and start there. Um, Because sometimes if we focus too heavily on where people are in the process and where they maybe should have been, uh, it leads us down a a dangerous path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and so that, that brings up the, how do you start this conversation in the first place, um, in the workplace? Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I do mean, you consider? That's, that's easy. You, you start it with difficulty. <laughs> that's, mm, mm-hmm. that's a right? given. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be easy, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. tough. And um, I, I use a really, really simple framework. It came from my book, uh, Finding Confidence in Conflict. It's called the Compassionate Curiosity Framework. Mm-hmm. And the goal with the framework is to make it very simple and approachable in these difficult conversations. It works really well as it relates to racial conversations, but just conflict resolution in general, I think is very helpful because it focuses on the emotions up front, overcoming that barrier, and then moving to productive dialogue. So step one, acknowledge and validate emotions. Step two, get curious with compassion. And step three, joint problem solving. And if you keep Mm -hmm. that in mind, it makes these conversations a lot easier and a lot more predictable. Um, So you feel like you have a higher level of control, which will make you feel more confident when the actual conversation happens. Yeah. It, it strikes me that, you know, we've heard a lot over the years about diversity, equity, inclusion training. And I've also heard, especially in the past year, it doesn't work. Um, and I think when they say it doesn't work, they're saying it doesn't change anything. Um, it's, a, it's a one-off kind of thing. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are different reasons. Um, so it, it strikes me it's not about training, it's about conversations. What, um, so what would you say to like a company or a team that's in the mindset of, oh, if we just have a training, then we'll be able to talk about this and move through it. Um, what's a, what's a better way? Yeah. And I think with, what we have to do is we have to figure out what it is we're trying to accomplish in the first place. And <laughs> yeah. I think people come in and say, I want an implicit bias training. I say, well, yes, I can do that. I have a background in psychology. I've done implicit bias trainings for health professionals, police officers, that kind of stuff. I can do that. But why do you want one? <laughs> Whoa, I never thought of that. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm supposed to. It's a box right. I have to check. Exactly. So I ask them, are you, what's your goal? Is it real change or are you trying to check boxes? Because I mean, if you want to pay me to check boxes, I, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, we have to figure out what it is you want to accomplish. And so the way that I like to do it is I, I think trainings that are just about raising awareness are pretty limited. Um, and studies have, have demonstrated that, um, especially with just implicit bias trainings by itself. The, the, when you do a meta-analysis on the results and the efficacy of those trainings, it's, it's not great. 
not great, uh, but people still do them. And so what I like to do is I like to talk about the psychology, which includes a discussion about the, uh, the implicit bias, but then we transition into what does this mean for me? What do I do about this? And um, what are the skills? So giving them the skills of conflict resolution as it relates to these issues so you can work within your organization to find the right solution because every organization is going to be different. Every organization has different challenges. So let's use these skills now to have these higher level conversations and then focus on committing to specific changes. That's really what matters. We, are we identifying problems? That's the first thing. Then are we doing something about it? That's the second thing. And so that's where the negotiation aspect comes into it. We identify the problem and use negotiation as a tool to solve the problem. Yeah. What else are you finding um, people are concerned about when it comes to talking about race at work? Yeah. So the, the big one is, let's go back to that threat uh, approach mm -hmm. versus avoid type of thing. Um, when people see these conversations, what do they think about? They think about the people who might have slipped up and said the wrong thing and got canceled, who got fired, right? Yeah. They see clear risks. They see potential political reprisal within their organization. I might lose my status. I might, somebody might take advantage of this and then leverage it against me. And now my position is gone, either completely gone or I'm lower in rank. And then social reprisal. Let's not forget that we go to work, not just to make money, to make a living, but that's usually the, one of the main sources of social interaction for people. And so then if my social status goes down, now I, I don't have any friends at work. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. And so we, we see these risks very clearly, but the payoff isn't as clear. And I think, again, that's one of the, the troubles with the, with the trainings where we just say, hey, everybody's racist and then we leave. That's not really very helpful. But if you can actually say, well, let's, these are clear metrics. These are the clear payoffs of, of changing the culture and, and identifying these problems and creating a more inclusive environment. Say, oh, now I get the, I get the point. I see the value on the other side of the conversation, but we don't take the time to build that argument at the front end. Um, and if people aren't bought in, then they're not really going to be fully engaged in the training and, it, and nothing that we teach will be, will latch on. Yeah. You, in, in all of that, you said one phrase <laughs> that I think is a barrier um, uh, for a lot of us. And that is everyone's racist or you know, that, would you mind unpacking that for a moment? Um, yeah. What, what that means? And uh, yeah, what does that mean? Yeah. So when you think about implicit bias, really this, what we're talking about are the underlying psychological mechanisms that help us to make quick decisions. Now, whether or not those decisions are correct is a different story, but because of repeated associations, we're going to come to quick conclusions. And those conclusions are going to decide, the, uh, determine the decision-making process that happens on the back end. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that we are not thinking machines that feel we're feeling machines that happen to think. And so we're going to immediately come to conclusions and feel certain ways about people, places, things, situations, um, political persuasions, those type of things. We're automatically, emotionally going to come to a conclusion. And then we're going to subsequently justify our conclusion with reason. So it's a backwards process. And so that's really what we're doing here. Now, the, the conclusions that we're going to come to, these are biases and biases can be either positive or negative. When it comes to biases about race, since all of us are exposed to the same social media, news media, print media, all of those things that are skewed in a direction that make it seem that certain races are better than other races, then everybody's gonna have these biases. So for example, um, they were talking about bias in print media in the city of New York. And they said, even though I think it was 51% of the people who were arrested in New York City were black, 76% um, of the people who were represented, represented as criminals in the newspaper were black. So because of that, there's a stronger association with black and criminality. Now, what's interested, interesting is that that same bias exists in white people and that same bias exists in black people because we're seeing the same media. So that's why I say implicit bias training usually leads everybody to recognize everybody's racist. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, <laughs> this is, that's the conclusion. Mm-hmm. That's the, what am I supposed to do about that, right? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of disempowering. And so um, I think it, that's why people, nobody gets really excited about doing a diversity training or gets excited about implicit bias. It's like, well, I'm just going to learn that everybody's a bad person and I don't know what to do next. Yeah, I mean, when you can you can you back up even a little bit and define racist? Yeah, <laughs> Ra- the term. That, now, this is a, I have a. I can, well, I can't say I love hate relationship. Who, I, who loves racism? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, I have a I have a weird relationship with this term because yeah. I feel as though it is overused to the point of meaninglessness at this point, and yeah. um, it's, yeah. people are so quick to throw that around. And and really, in America, being called a racist is one of the worst things you can be called. You, yeah. I can't, I'm struggling to think about anything other than an actual crime that would be worse than being called a racist in America. You can barely recover from that. And so if we're going through trainings that are designed to say, hey, you're a racist, people are going to reach out. Yay! <laughs> yeah, who, who, yeah. who wants that? And so right. for me, I, I like to distinguish between racist and racial impact. Because mm-hmm. somebody who is not a racist could unwittingly do something that has an, a racial impact. People are more willing to accept that rather than the title of racist. And if we think about what racism is in general, we want to think about two main kinds of racism. We have individual racism, and then mm-hmm. we have systemic racism, institutional racism, those type of things. So with individual racism, we have explicit racism and implicit racism. So implicit racism, subconscious, we're talking implicit bias, those type of things. Explicit racism is like, hey, I'm using the N-word and mm-hmm. I love using the N-word. Um, that's, you know, that's a problem in some places, but it's not the biggest issue I think we face as a nation. Um, it's yeah. the implicit racism, but more so the structural racism. And so these are the policies and procedures that are baked into society that continuously produce inequitable outcomes. So an example would be um, housing. Housing Mm -hmm. is a great example where you have redlining from the 1930s where banks decided which communities they were going to invest in. And so they would, one of the major criteria that they would look at was the amount of uh, uh, black people that were present in an area. Oh, lots of black people not investing there. And so you say, well, that was 1936. What's, what's the problem? Well, what you recognize is that if you look at a map where they show the best communities, the, the best schools, the best hospitals, everything like that, those are the communities that were, that received a lot of investment back in the, from the 1900s and on forward. And so then if you overlay that with a racial map, what you find is that the majority of minorities are going to be in the areas that did not receive investment still. And as a result of that, they're not privy to the same opportunities. And so it's not that a single racist who is currently alive right now is, is moving around these, these, uh, these people like chess pieces saying, ha ha, I've, I've, I've done it this time. They're not doing that. It's the, the yeah. system that was created over many years that continues to produce inequitable outcomes. Yeah. And that system gets handed down. You know, I might be a 20 something um, mortgage officer in a bank and be handed, here's a map of the community. Here's the, you know, whatever distribution of wealth and, you know, whatever. Um, And I'm part of determining is the asking price for that house fair. Um, I might not realize I'm looking at a map that that the values of the the land, the houses, all of that have been passed down from a system that was based on redlining. Exactly. And and so what what our responsibility is now and what I'm grateful is coming to the fore is that it's like we we can we can start questioning those things. Um stop assuming, well, that's, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, you know, taking a look more critically at um, why things are the way they are. Right. And, and think about it, Beth, there's never a time in grade school, middle school, high school, or even college where this is taught. Uh, yeah. Maybe when you get to college, then you can, if you have that interest, you can look for it. But I, the idea, the concept of systemic racism is not something that is taught. And so what we are taught, though, is that this is America. Everybody's free. 
everybody has equal access to opportunity. Everybody has a chance to succeed. If you work hard, you get what you deserve. If you don't work hard, you get what you deserve. And so if, if we look at these communities and then we see certain populations doing well consistently and we see other populations not doing well consistently, then we're gonna to come to a conclusion based on what we were taught about America and say, well, the people who are doing well, they've earned it. The people who aren't doing well, they've earned that too. And mm -hmm. so if we don't understand the systems that kind of perpetuate these problems, then it really almost leaves us no other alternative but to determine that, oh, okay, well, this group is better than this group. Mm -hmm. What other solution is there? And so, again, I think one of the best things that has come out of this is not necessarily coming from bias training, but also on helping people to understand how systems work and operate. And people listening might say, well, I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not a politician. I have but one vote, depending on mm -hmm. which state I'm in, given the electoral college. <laughs> And yeah. um, so what can I do? And I say, well, what we want to do is we want to focus on three main areas, family, work, and your community. Those are places where you can have pretty immediate impacts. And within your workplace, you can say, all right, where are some potential structures that could be producing inequitable outcomes here? How come there is a good amount of diversity here for the people who are coming in, but then when I look at the board level and the, the C-suite, um, almost everybody's white and it's 70% male. How is that the case? What's going on? So now we can investigate and recognize what troubles might exist within the fabric of our institution. Then we can use negotiation as one of those nego those uh, conflict resolution tools to say, oh, this is the problem. We need to make certain changes and we can have the difficult conversation about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is one of the gifts of what's happening right now is the, it, you, you I, I think of both um, the, the rising awareness of systemic racism on the part of people that were asleep to it before, um, and and the pandemic itself is recognizing our interconnectedness, our interrelatedness, and that everything is a system and that what impacts one impacts all in some way. And um, and I appreciate that you're inviting us to look at our workplaces that way. Because, um, you know, our workplaces are a microcosm of, mm -hmm. of the bigger society. And to focus on, well, you know, I might not have control out here, but what is within my locus of control? Um, and, and how can I start being more intentional and present and um, brave, you know, courageous in those spaces? Absolutely. And the term you used is important, locus of control. Because mm -hmm. if we try to take control of things that are not within our control, then we experience learned helplessness. That's when we get apathetic. And then we're mm -hmm. not going to take action. But if we can clearly define a problem within an institution where we can have an impact, then we can see the needle start to move based on our activity. And that mm -hmm. it becomes a, a self-reinforcing type of system, right? Where we take action, we see something change, and you say, wow, that felt good. Let me do it again. <laughs> and we just keep on going. And um, that, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Well, I keep, as you're talking about implicit bias, I also think of confirmation bias. And, um, you know, what you just described strikes me as like shifting that confirmation bias story of reasons why it doesn't work, or here's the, um, the obstacles to creating evidence that, oh, you know, this change is possible. Let's have a positive conversation or a healthy, productive conflict um, to move things forward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what if, and, and uh, you know, I, I sense that um, if you're willing, we could have another conversation down the road <laughs> just to kind of keep, keep uh, chipping away at this a little bit. But um, what if I'm the employee in a company and, uh, you know, I, I would say it, it might be different whether I'm a person of color or not, um, that I, I feel like we need to be having these conversations and we're not. Like, it's not coming from leadership. But... I am like, this is like the elephant in the room that needs to be named. Um, what, what would you advise someone in that position? Yeah, so first what I would do is I wouldn't make it an ambush. 
where we confront the CEO in the hallway. Hey, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, racist, <laughs> come here. <laughs> exactly. No, because if, if even if it's just passing somebody in the hallway, we bring it up. Um, people are not going to be prepared. And the easiest answer is going to be no. Um, that's the safest answer. No means safety. A lot of times when people say no, it might not necessarily be because they've actually reasoned through what you said. It's just because they're choosing the safest op option and the status quo is often perceived to be the safest option. So what I would say is actually sit down and, and schedule a meeting to have a discussion about it and then use the framework. The framework makes it really easy. So remember, compassionate curiosity framework, acknowledge uh, and validate emotions, get curious with compassion, joint problem solving. And so acknowledge the emotion listen, this is awkward for everybody. That's the emotion. The emotion is awkward. And it, it seems as though this awkwardness is preventing us from having this conversation. Is that a fair assessment? And see where it goes. Get curious with compassion. So what are your thoughts on the situation? What do you think our role is as an organization? What do you think we could do better? And then you can provide some information, those type of things. Then we transition into joint problem solving. So what can we do? Now let's get more specific. Concretely, what can we do? What's our next step? And get the person to commit to that first small step. The first small step might be creating a task force. People love task forces. Um, <laughs> but, but then make sure that in the negotiation, we say, all right, well, what does the task force do? Because I want the task force to not just, hey, let's, let's talk about this and check the box. Let's, um, let's come up with some recommendations. So negotiate the process. What does the task force do? What's the power? What's the next step, right? All, that's, that's why the, the podcast is called Negotiate Anything. I want you to think expansively about it. So we're thinking about not just negotiating substantively within conversations, but how can we use this as a, an overall strategic tool to, to determine how we interact with each other? And negotiating the process, the power, the authority, decision-making structures, those are all things that are on the table um, that could really have an impact on the way things move forward. So I think that's a, a simple example of how you can open it up and then try to take it to the next level. Yeah, nice. So if people want more information and uh, learn more about how to do this, what can they where can they go? <laughs> yeah, so check out the LinkedIn course. I think that's, a, well, it's two now. So um, how to have difficult conversations about race at work and um, uh, driving and motivating change and anti-racism within your company. And um, if you are having these difficult conversations, check out our guide. We have a free guide. If you go to AmericanNegotiationInstitute.com slash justice, you can get um, access to a free guide on how to have difficult conversations about race that'll help you to prepare beforehand um, so you're in a position where you have more confidence during the conversation. And then, of course, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and, uh, and check out the podcast. I'm assuming that the people listening to this podcast are podcast listeners. So I <laughs> hope so. I, I hope so. I think so. Yeah. I so. don't think I have an exclusive uh, <laughs> something. Right. Yeah. So, so check out the Negotiate yeah. Anything podcast. We have awesome guests like Beth coming mm -hmm. on the show. It's been um, a pleasure. And uh, so, yeah, check that out. But yeah, thank you for this. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for uh, jumping into the video pool. And, uh, and thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for um, uh, your generosity um, in, in sharing with us and with me. And um, yeah, it's just so, so vital. And I'm just appreciative. So thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. <laughs> and I will include links to everything that you mentioned in the um, episode webpage. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Well, that was fun. Okay. Yeah. How was the first Very good. video podcast for you? I hope <laughs> it was okay. I highly recommend that you check out Kwame's website and LinkedIn courses. I'll also be linking to some anti-racism resources on the episode webpage and encourage you to continue to consider opportunities to grow in your understanding of and engagement with this really important and complex topic. There is a lot to talk about, so I consider this just the start of the conversation here on How Can I Say This, and I hope to have more guests on to support us and become Becoming more fluent in our discussions about race and equity. Your call to action is to practice Kwame's invitation to approach any difficult conversation with compassionate curiosity.
One way to do this is to set aside any impulse to debate or argue, to try to change someone's mind, or to convince them that you're right about whatever it is that you are in disagreement about. You can even let go of trying to educate someone if you think that they don't have enough information. All of those strategies, whether that's debating or arguing or trying to convince or educate, they're likely to cause the other person to go on the defensive and to not want to engage in conversation. It's likely to just shut it all down. I have a dear friend who recently has been posting opinions that I disagree with on social media. And in my, in the, sort of in my little internal fantasy world, I had different impulses. And one of my first impulses was to question her conclusions. And I have to say, very directly question them in perhaps not a very compassionate way. If I had followed through on that impulse, even if I was technically being curious, it definitely would not have been out of compassion. It would have been out of righteousness. So I shifted my perspective and decided instead to say, tell me more. Another question that I've mentioned on this podcast before that can help you get into compassionate frame of mind is to imagine how the other person might answer if you ask, what's it like to be you? In my friend's case, considering that question brought up that she's a stay-at-home mom with two little boys, one of them with a learning disability. While I can't imagine what her life is actually like on a day-to-day -day basis, remembering her context helped me to soften my stance and come at it from genuine, compassionate curiosity. Maybe asking that question, what's it like to be you, can help you to do the same. I hope you'll share this episode with any friends, family members, and colleagues that you think might find it interesting. I also appreciate your reviews and ratings on whatever platform you find this podcast. And please subscribe and come back for future episodes. Be part of the movement to bring more courageous communication into the world. This is Beth Bilo, and you've been listening to How Can I Say This? Our podcast producer is Paul Messing, and our theme music is by Brett Anderson. Thanks to Kwame for the enlightening conversation, and to you for joining me today. And I invite you to take what you've learned here and use it to speak up, speak out, and speak courageously. Mm -hmm.